We are in your exhibition, in lieu of what is, in Basel, Kunsthalle Basel. The show has just opened, and yet, uh, with every exhibition, artists world-built. They take us places, they tell us stories. Maybe we can start by you telling us where we are in your show. Uh, where have you taken us? So in this exhibition, we are um, amongst a set of vessels that have originated where I am normally based, and that place is Kuwait. And these, um, what would be drinking fountains, are found, as I understand it, all over Kuwait, sort of in front of every school or business or street corner or roundabout. You can find these drinking fountains that are, rather than being public or publicly maintained, they're sort of individual initiatives linked back to a long history of charity from a moment when water was kind of um, collected in a different way. And maybe it's interesting to know how people in the Gulf region get their water now. Um, so historically, water in Kuwait was brought from the Shat al Arab River, which is just north of Kuwait in southern Iraq. So um, when Kuwait was still an adobe city, these Dao boats that also, you know, people were um, using the Dao boats to kind of collect pearls, were also sent to southern Iraq to bring back water from the river, the Shat al Arab River. And today, um, the country is more dependent on like water from desalination plants, which is only something that could be afforded with the, with the, with the advent and export of oil. And yet these desalination plants, whether they're in Kuwait or elsewhere, are um, are an ecological crisis in a way yeah. um, because they're huge consumers of energy um, and have other implications for the ecology. Maybe I think it's interesting for someone who takes water for granted or who doesn't think about where it comes from or how certain populations have access to this most basic human need and resource to to speak a bit about like how water became such a theme in this exhibition and for you in your thinking? For me, it was a way of understanding this kind of, um, this estranged relationship between two neighboring communities that are essentially the same group of people. And um, my grandmother on my father's side is from Basra um, in the south of Iraq. And um, I grew up seeing photographs of my family in, in Basra, but never um, had the opportunity to visit because since the, since the Gulf War, that relationship was kind of disrupted. Whereas I think during my father's time, there was a much more porous border between Iraq and Kuwait. And nowadays it's like, it's a very hard line and, and a much more contentious border. And so I was interested in understanding that side of my family history and, um, and just being able to cross over. Um, and in that exploration, I found out that historically Kuwait's water came from the Shat al Arab. And also I learned about the destruction of the, the marshlands in southern Iraq and some of the other. Um, when people think about the Arab world, they often think about a barren or lifeless place. And, and for me to learn about the destruction of 22 million palm trees in southern Iraq was shocking, no? And so. This work is part of a group of works that looks at the kind of the destruction of, of, of nature in this part of the Arab world. It's kind of been a, an ongoing concern of yours to trace so-called marginal histories, um, questions of migration, borders, colonialism, and how these have impacts on, uh, sometimes invisible ones, on, on our present. This show, traces just one of many strains of thought that have, I know, been with you um, for a number of years. 
in this main room at Kunsthalle Basel. Of course, it takes the form of these oversized water vessels, five of them, sort of each um, of which you, you beautifully locate sort of where they came from or what their histories are. But one of the things that impressed me so much, and I, and I think the public as well, is how you've turned this space almost into a, an archaeological dig, where you've, you've put on display these vessels here, larger than our bodies, but um, these vessels in order to pinpoint uh, the histories that you've just talked about, histories of nation building, of, you know, um, peoples that have been separated by a decision of a border that was made by colonial powers long before, or war, or conflict, or tensions created um, over resources. Maybe it's interesting to walk the viewer of this video through your show and talk about how this piece in the main room connects to um, other things you find in your exhibition. So in the middle room, there's an installation. It's like a, a hanging tapestry made of found objects. And those objects are um, belts for trans transporting heavy material. You often see them on construction sites or in ports for offloading containers off of ships and that sort of thing. And in the second room, I've turned that into like a hanging tapestry, typically like how you would see a, a tapestry in, in an anthropological museum or like a remnant of a tapestry from a different time. And the belts for me, when I saw, when I saw them in use, they, it just made me think of the mass effort to destroy the Martians because it was like the largest engineered um, crime against nature, the 20th century in the sense that like, yeah, a lot of material was brought into the Martians to create all this infrastructure to drain the marshes. And so in my imagination, it relates to this, this desire, obsession that we have as humans to want to harness and control nature and, um, and the measures that you know, we're willing to take to, to be able to do that, where if it doesn't cooperate, we're just going to eliminate it. You know? And this happened factually, actually, in, in the southern marshlands of Iraq, but it's almost a metaphor for a larger um, a larger question or problem with this idea of wanting to wanting to not only control nature but wanting to harness its resources to our own ends right um, to fulfill our own desire for more and more. I wonder um, in your show if sort of how you came to connect these three bodies of work rather than like, I say that, I'd say that rather than think about like a medium, I'm, I'm more looking for mediums to express the ideas that, I'm, I, that I have. And so the works, in my mind, are different upshots of, of these ideas that I'm, um, that I'm visiting for the first time or exploring and unpacking. And so they result in like different things. There's a, the sculptures, there's a sound work that I do, and then there's the film and other, and other types of sculptures, different materials. Um, but I went off road. What was your question? <laughs> no, I think I think that's actually a, just a more interesting way. I mean, you're an artist without a medium. In yeah. fact, you come to make things on the basis of the histories you want to explore, or the ideas or questions you want to ask. But it can take many forms. And here, it's sculpture or a, a display system and a, a found object rendered into something and a sound piece. But you've worked in many different media. and Maybe it's interesting to hear a bit about how you decide what form something will take mm -hmm. um, after you have the question in your head of what it, sh what it should ask. Yeah, I think that making works in general is, a, is, an, is an excuse to, to learn. And so for me, while I'm, while I'm learning about um, something that I'm thinking about, I'm, think I'm, I'm simultaneously or concurrently thinking about ways of of representing those ideas. And uh, yeah, the work that I do, I think, is is very specifically tied to a place, but I'm also interested in how these upshots can um, can be perceived outside of the region that they're, you know, that they're originally conceived in and relate to other places in the world. So rather than making art from 
from an area that like fulfills the expectation of what Arab art looks like or what art from Latin America looks like. I'm interested in making making work that can speak to these reoccurring situations across the globe and relating what I do in one place to, to situations elsewhere. And so a lot of my work has to do with knowing, like actually insisting on, on staying and exploring and the neighboring territories or understanding the region despite this fragmentation and despite the difficulties of, um, of traveling or moving across borders and really actually like um, trying to ignore those, those imposed borders and make work again that tries to connect somehow the, the social fabric that has been cut off in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It's beautiful, actually, um, as a as a starting point for thinking about how to world build, how to make art that makes us as visitors, and I count myself amongst the lucky visitors that get to encounter your work, um, how you make us look at and think about what is happening in regions that we may, that may feel far away, but actually the questions are so pertinent to how we live, how we have lived, what we've done, how we want to live. The, the last room of the exhibition has this really beautiful um, sound piece, uh, sounds that I, for one, had never heard before. And for me, it's, it's also a, a fantastic end to the show, because if indeed you're exploring questions of conflict and uh, control, how power and violence have been meted out on nature, on people. Um, the last room is, is hopeful in some strange way, even if it's an almost extinct language that we're hearing. It also speaks to how one human needs to be able to speak to the other, whoever that other may be. And um, I would love it if you would say a little bit more about your encounter with this sound for the first time. So the sound installation in the final room um, is, of a, is of a young man calling his buffalo back from the water. And the first time I heard this, I was um, very moved by, by the sound because it is, a, it is a kind of combination of language, animal mimicry and song. And, um, and it is an attempt to speak the language of the other, you know, and, and just to see the, the buffaloes coming back and responding to a call. The buffalo in, in, in the southern marshlands of Iraq have no markings or have no um, bells or harnesses, or if you think about like the way that animals are treated, and like the cattle industry and how they're all ushered in or moved moved into, there's there's a, um, it's much more violent in the sense that the animals are being dominated. And Ghassim's call is a very like gentle um, expression of of his relationship to the animals that he lives with, and um, it's a it's a reciprocal kind of relationship where they look after each other.